Good afternoon. I'm Ty Schmidt, Chief of Police for the City of Champlin, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a public notification meeting uh, regarding a predatory offender that has moved into the City of Champlin. Community notification is mandated by state statute anytime a level three predatory offender moves into a community. Uh, today, I have Brad Vandervet with me uh, from the Minnesota Department of Corrections, and he's going to be conducting our presentation. This presentation will be recorded and it will be accessible through the City of Champlin website and through the Champlin Police Department's YouTube channel. Um, during the live portion of the meeting, we will take questions over Zoom chat. For anyone viewing this presentation in the recorded format, uh, you can submit questions through the email address that will be included at the end of this presenta presentation. So I'm going to hand it off to Brett. Thank you, Chief. And thank you, everybody, for taking your time to review this important information. And as you heard, my name is Brad Vandervet, and I'm with the Minnesota Department of Corrections in the Risk Assessment and Community Notification Unit. And today, I'd like to share with you some information um, with regard to not only the individual that you're here to learn about today, but also uh, the broader context of the state's risk management system. Um, so my presentation is going to come in three really distinct portions. So where I like to begin is, is with what we really know as communities, and that is that those who engage in this type of harm, sexual harm, they exist. And so what really then becomes the question is, is what are we doing as various agencies throughout the state down to county level to city and even township level uh, as we address those whom we become aware of that are come through that uh, criminal justice system. And so one of those key components that first came online in that broader risk management system was the registry. Now, as you can see, the registry began in 1991 is really founded and predicated on the advocacy of the Jacob Wetterling family and other groups as after the abduction of Jacob, they went around and really asked law enforcement, what more can we do to assist you in the important work that you're doing with regard to this unique population? And at the time, law enforcement really resoundingly said, what we need is a system that collates our data, that takes all of this information that prior to the registry used to be stored in-house and within each unique agency's file systems and databases, and now made it broadly accessible to all agencies throughout the state and beyond so that they can access it in a very timely fashion. And so the registry was born from that. And you can see the robustness of that of that database. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind with the registry is that it is by law deemed private information, meaning this information that is collected and retained by the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension is for law enforcement purposes only. And so uh, they can access and, and uh, observe all kinds of information such as a registrant's address, that's their primary address or any other addresses that they may frequent. Think of places like uh, visiting family members or loved ones uh, for a significant period of time uh, or vacation properties or things of that nature. They also must register any employment that they have and also make known to law enforcement any vehicles that they may operate for that employer. Other information that they have to provide is any schools that they're enrolled in and attending or any vehicles that they themselves either use, own, or possess. Um, other components would be things such as identifying marks, such as scars or tattoos. They also must provide phone numbers for law enforcement and anything that they may be renting as far as like rental, uh, like storage units and things of that nature. So you see the robustness of the data collected. Now, the next question that will often come along uh, as we talk about the registry is, is how does it work with regard to who goes on it? And as you can see, the registry has grown and changed since its inception in the early 90s to about where in 95, the legislature saw the benefit of this tool uh, to law enforcement and added additional types of crimes that were not sex specific to, the, to that registration requirement. 
And so as you can see here, such crimes as kidnapping and false imprisonment got added on. And so the name had to change and it went from the sex offender registry to the predatory offender registry. So an easy way to keep that straight in your mind as we go forward today is this, is that all sex offenders are predatory offenders while not every predatory offender is a sex offender. With regard to the registry, as I mentioned earlier, not the information kept on it is, is not for public uh, access. However, for meetings like this, I'm able to take a flyover view of that database to really help to show you just what's going on in and around our communities. And as you look at this information and these numbers here, I want to put in your mind the analogy of a funnel. And as you think of that widest end of that funnel, know that this is those types of crimes that occur, those sexual uh, uh, offenses and conduct and behavior that are going on in communities. And from what we understand from all of the research and data available is that only a portion of those offenses that are going on ever go on to be reported to law enforcement. And our funnel narrows. And from those that do get reported to law enforcement, only a portion of that group go on to receive formal charges, and we narrow yet again. And of those charged, only a portion of that group will go on to receive convictions, and of those convicted, only a portion of that group will go on to cross the threshold of a state prison. And I'll go into more detail here in a bit as to why that's an important distinction. But just know, as we are going down that narrowing effect, when we get to uh, the first of this year, at, at, at a snapshot, we had approximately 18,790 registered individuals in Minnesota. That's all of them. Those with no risk level assigned or those of levels one, two, or three. And that's already a good two thirds of the way down that funnel. As of the second, when I most recently took a snapshot of these numbers, you can see how that 18,790 breaks down within our own communities. You can see at that time, Hennepin County had 2,783 of them residing within its boundaries as primary residents. 151 of those, that smaller number to the right, are those designated risk level three. And so you can see that we, and those are the group that we get to talk about. So you can see that narrowing effect, and we only get to talk about a portion of that broader component. Now, if you look at Champlin proper, at the time that I ran these numbers, you can see of that 2,783, 30 were reporting primary residents here in Champlin, two now of whom are subject to that broad public notification. And again, you can just see where that broad awareness becomes so critical. And you can see other neighboring communities throughout the area. And the thing to take away from this is that no community in the state has zero registered individuals residing within it. And more importantly, no community in the state would ever have it such that they could say nobody who presents a potential risk ever enters our community. And so I want to give you some more information as to how to apply all this into those family and community safety planning efforts so that you can have the most robust plan possible. Another component of that broader risk management system that came online was the Notification Act. And as you can see, that started in 1997 and is really founded on the understanding and knowledge from all that research is that a well-informed community is in fact a safer community. And we in the Department of Corrections commend and thank the Champlain Police Department in all of its efforts to ensure that the best information gets out to as many of you as possible. Because the Notification Act is the reason we're here today and able to talk with you about this information, it's important to go into a little more detail as to how it works. So with notification, an individual to be subject to it must have crossed the threshold of prison, as I mentioned earlier on with those numbers. If they do not go to prison, they are not assessed or assigned a risk level. So that can be any prison within the state or throughout the United States to include US territories, military prisons, and federal prisons. So inevitably that leaves the group of individuals that were adjudicated as juveniles, 
who are placed on the registry and those who received stayed or probationary sentences as a group of no level assigned individuals. That does not imply that they have no risk. It simply means that their risk is not looked at unless or until they enter prison. So the way that this is done is it's really kind of broken up into two distinct roles. When an individual crosses into the prison system, the Department of Corrections is tasked with the responsibility of assessing and assigning that risk level. And that is done through the End of Confinement Review Committee or the ECRC. Now the End of Confinement Review Committee will convene 90 days prior to that registrant's release into the community or earlier, and they will review all of the information available to them as they go forward on the important task of assigning a risk level. One of the components to assist this committee is the uh, risk assessment tool known as the MINSOST or the Minnesota Sex Offender Screening Tool. Now it's important to understand this tool because it in, in a large way guides that risk level assignment. So it was to, to understand it best, just know that it was born out of a large study conducted right here in Minnesota by the State Department of Corrections, where the initial portion began in the early 90s at the onset of these laws and concluded initially in the 2000s. So over a decade's time, where over 3,166 known male sex offenders were observed and uh, uh, reviewed and assessed when they entered the community. And these assessors marked their successes and they marked their failures. And these failures became known as those normed risk assessment uh, components. So when I speak to you today, know that when I say a level one or two or three, I'm speaking as to their risk as it relates to that peer group. Couple things to keep in mind when it comes to risk assessment tools is that no risk assessment tool can predict the future. And risk is dynamic. Risk level one individual today, if they are not adhering to those expectations of their supervision, of their treatment, of the community, and so on, may find that their risk is reviewed and their level goes up. Just as a level three individual today may find that if they've lived a lengthy period of time in the community quietly and safely, that their risk may be reviewed and their level may go down. So once a risk level is assessed and assigned by the committee, the handoff then goes to our partners in law enforcement. And law enforcement provides notification within the scope of that level assigned. For a level one individual, law enforcement will provide notification to other law enforcement agencies, to victims of or witnesses to the offense if they've requested that level of enhanced notification. And they may also notify those immediate adult household members residing in the home with that individual. And that is the scope of a level one notification. A level two notification expands on those individuals and entities we just discussed and includes additional individuals or entities that law enforcement determines to be at particular risk based on their registrant's known pattern of conduct and behavior. Now, it's often believed that with a level two, law enforcement will provide notification to uh, agencies and entities such as schools or daycares or other places where children are known to congregate. But as you'll see here in a moment, that may not always be the case. So in a scenario where law enforcement is made aware of a level two coming into their community and they receive a dossier of information from the risk assessment unit, and determine through their review of that available information that this individual focuses their conduct and behavior against adult females at social gatherings, such as bars or concert venues or things like that. In that scenario, law enforcement may find that it is prudent to notify the proprietor of those venues of this person's presence so that they can alert them if they're around versus the local daycare that provides care for children from infancy to school age. 
Now on the flip side, if you have a level two coming into a community and law enforcement determines that this individual focuses their conduct and behavior against unaccompanied minors, think teens in transition from school to after school programming or home. And law enforcement knows within their community that the teens hang out at a particular hotspot where they socialize and congregate in those down times. Now, in a scenario like that, law enforcement very well may, with a level two, go to the proprietor of that hangout spot and inform them, if you see this individual loitering around, creating relationships with the kids, let us know. Give us a call. We're going to come out and talk to them and find out more about what they may be up to. And that is the nuance of a level two notification. And then with a level three notification, law enforcement will initiate broad public notification. And that comes in many different varieties and formats. And really, it comes down to how law enforcement best communicates with its own community. And so you can always find an individual subject to broad notification, a level three designee, on the Department of Corrections public registrant search. That is where you will always find them. And then additional notifications will be made as the agencies that are dealing with the individual see appropriate and fit. So I wanna shift gears now and share with you a little bit of the specific information about the research studies that have been conducted on this unique population so that you can use it as you apply all this knowledge into your own family and community safety planning efforts. And where I wanna begin with the data is at that narrowest end of that funnel with those individuals that are coming out of prison. Now, what we know from, from tracking those individuals over decades now uh, is that the number of folks coming into the prison and then out uh, does fluctuate and change year after year. However, what we find is that on average, the breakdown of risk level assignment tends to stay fairly static to the point where we can say pretty confidently that at least two thirds are going to be those designated that level one or level two risk designation on average, again, approximately 15% will fall into that level three category. Now you may think to yourself, Brad, is it really that beneficial to know so little about this smallest percentage? And, and the truth is, it is beneficial because the information we're able to share and provide you about that group is applicable much more broadly as it can go towards any relationship or any interactions that you're observing in and around your own community and within your own families. Other information I wanna share with you is just another snapshot. This is a, a quick snap of the uh, public registrant search. If you go to the Minnesota Department of Corrections homepage and you go about two thirds of the way down, click on the magnifying glass icon and select the public registrant search and say, show them all to me. If you'd have done that on February 2nd, you would have seen 457. So thinking back to that 18,700 sum, we know that this is a very small portion of that larger group. And thinking back to my funnel analogy, we know that that 18,000 sum is only a fraction of all of what's going on. And so keeping that in mind, you'll see also out of that 457, at the time there were 14 who were out of compliance and need to be returned to compliance with that registration requirement. So use this as a tool as you're vetting folks in and around communities that you may frequent. Other information that I wanna share with you today as you're contemplating all of this is the relationships between those who engage in this type of harm and the people they hurt. And as you can see here, as you look at this information, the majority of those that harm children and teens are known to them, have somehow established and exploited a relationship of trust that they've built or attained. 7% on average fall into that stranger category. Now, as you look at this, that's the category that's going to give you the most pause, as it should, because you know with your own family and your acquaintances as parents and trusted adults and loved ones, you know you have a lot of influence over those family members and extended acquaintances. But when you think about that stranger group, this is that group you have, you don't have that direct influence over. 
And so it's worth getting into a little bit more on how this data was compiled and collected. So this actually comes from the US Department of Justice out of their 2000 study, but it really mirrors what we found in our own Department of Corrections study. With those studies, the assessors had to create a cutoff of what constitutes a relationship or a knowing. And so it was determined that 24 hours would be that cutoff. If they could not show through their research that there was a knowing of 24 hours or greater, it would inevitably go into that stranger category. So that would include situations or scenarios like this, where two teenagers uh, meet up at a house party, a local gathering, and the night is going the way it's going, and they leave the watchful gaze of the group to either a more isolated location in the home or off the property or whatever the case may be. And the night takes an awful turn. Now that scenario would fall into that stranger category. But what we tend to think of more as family and as loved ones, when we think of strangers, is that person lurking just beyond our awareness, just outside of our scope of knowledge, who has ill intent. And that group falls in a much smaller percentage of about 3%. Now that is cold comfort. We're all very well aware. But as you are thinking about your finite resources, both within your own family and broader community, the last thing we want is for you to be focusing all of your energy on that 3% group. We know, again, through all the research and data, and it is good data, is that the more likely scenario is going to be somebody abusing a relationship of trust. The last bit of data I want to share with you before we get into the specifics about the man you're here to learn about today is the age breakdowns of those harmed. And as you look at this information, you'll see that it's broken into thirds. But very quickly, you'll start to piece apart these age ranges and you'll see that two thirds are children. And you're going to look at that narrowest age range next, that 13 to 17 age range constitutes 33% of those harmed. That's 9% of our population, and it is worth unpacking what might be going on here. So what we know from those early ages, that zero to 12 age range, is that those parents and trusted adults are very much still influencing and impacting who gets to come in and have those all important relationships with those children. So as agencies and organizations, we work diligently to make sure that those parents and trusted support people have the best tools available to vet the people coming into those kids' lives. But when we get to those critical teenage years, children start to develop their own autonomy and they begin to formulate friendships and relationships outside of the watchful gaze of that support network. And our kids deserve every bit of that. And we work so hard to create that very environment within our communities so that our kids can go out and have that ability to express themselves and explore their own autonomy. But what it does ultimately, unfortunately, is create vulnerability because now they may find themselves in a situation that they were not prepared for or that is confusing or frightening them. And so what we used to do, the old method was the talk, where we would pull our teen aside at that critical age as, as parents or, or loved ones, and we would have this moment where we would remove the veil just enough so that we could show our child that the world was not as safe as it had been made to be for them when they were younger. And we found with that model that we would often get kind of one of two really distinct reactions. And that was either they would just rebuke the information, say, mom, dad, you're overreacting. My friends are safe. Everything's fine. Or we'd get the opposite side of the coin where they would say, mom, dad, that is the most frightening information you could have possibly shared with me. And I am no longer going to engage in the very activities I've grown to love. Neither reaction is what we seek. So what we've moved toward now with the assistance and help of our victim services advocacy groups and programs throughout the state and beyond is that we have a lot of little talks with our kids from those very early years all the way up and through those formative teenage years, each building on the other in an age appropriate way. So as not to create fear, because we know that scared kids 
do not equal safe kids. But we also need our children to understand that nice people do not equal safe people. And so I will provide you some additional information and resources so that you can apply that into your family safety planning efforts. But now I wanna shift gears and talk to you about the man you're here to learn about today. Use the information that I've shared so far as an overlay. See where things may align and see where they may diverge. This is Caleb Pipe Boyd, uh, also known as uh, Mr. Callens. He had a legal name change uh, some years back, but if you search either name, you'll get his information. First, I wanna speak to photographs. Photographs are updated on average of annually, or should the subject significantly change or modify their appearance. So if you were to see this man or anyone who you know from the, reg or from the public registrant search uh, to, to have changed their appearance and no longer look like they do in these photographs, you can certainly contact local law enforcement or corrections if they're involved. And they will ensure that new photographs are taken and placed onto the registry where I will then attain them and make sure they go up onto this uh, tool for you to have. These are Mr. Pipe Boyd's vitals. He's currently 41 years of age and is residing at the 7,000 block of 110th Avenue North here in the community of Champlin. Now I wanna take a moment and speak to a question that often comes up in meetings and conversations like this. And that question is, is Brad, can you please tell us where he lives? We would find it great comfort if we knew where his head hit the pillow at night. And as you recall from my earlier information, the, the data collected by that registry is private data and is for law enforcement purposes only. Law enforcement very much knows what home he resides in. But what we find through proximal addresses such as this is that the community in this area, no doubt, will become aware of this man as they see him come and go throughout his day-to-day -day activities. And that's just fine. And they'll share that information among themselves, again, for community safety purposes, not to harass or to, uh, to make him uncomfortable, but to inform and educate. And again, that's just fine. But what we do not want as agencies is for that private information to become more publicly known, which ultimately could bring in a vigilante revenge type scenario from somebody well outside of the Champlain community who enters to exact some harm that does nothing to restore a victim or does nothing to mitigate potential risk and only serves to disrupt the very thing you've all worked so hard to achieve here within Champlain. Other information I want to share with you about Mr. Pipe Boyd is his registrable offense history. This is not an exhaustive criminal history. If you are interested in this man or anyone's criminal history, you can access that on the Bureau of Criminal Apprehensions website under their public criminal history search tool. There you will enter in anybody's first name, last name, and date of birth, which you have here for this man and you will get their full criminal history. But because registration is specific to sex crimes and crimes of kidnapping um, or um, uh, false imprisonment, we focus our notification and our history on those components that led to the registration and ultimately to that risk level assignment. So I wanna get right into the specifics of what occurred with this man. Maybe click on the slide. There you go. Okay. In 1997, Mr. Pike Boyd was convicted of criminal sexual conduct first degree out of Hennepin County. This crime was committed against a seven year old female victim. Mr. Pike Boyd was 16 years of age at that time. So he was a minor at that time. He knew this victim and exploited that relationship that he had to, to abuse that unmonitored access that he had gained. 
using the victim's youth and naivete as a means to maintain control. And for this crime, once it became known to law enforcement, he again, at the time having been a minor himself, received a youth disposition. Now remembering back to my earlier explanation, this would have triggered registration for this man or this child at the time, but no risk level assessment or assignment because it's a juvenile adjudication. Had it stayed there, that we wouldn't be speaking about him today. However, in 2013, Mr. Pipe Boyd was convicted of an assault, substantial bodily harm out of Hennepin County. He was also so charged with, out of that same set of circumstances, a criminal sexual conduct third degree. Now in Minnesota, if you are charged with a registrable crime, such as criminal sexual conduct third degree, but convicted out of, of some other crime stemming from the same set of circumstances, you still have to register. Assault in and of itself is not a registrable offense. However, the CSC3 was also an, a component, so registration was required. So this crime against this person was, this was an adult male victim. Uh, the, we do not know the age of this victim. Um, it was a homeless male residing or spending the night in the same location as Mr. Pipe Boyd. Um, while this victim was asleep, Mr. Pipe Boyd uh, began assaulting him. As he awoke to the assault, Mr. Pipe Boyd uh, struck him and rendered him unconscious. And for this crime, Mr. Pipe Boyd was committed to prison as an adult now in 2013 for 24 months. Now I'm going to take this opportunity to speak to another question that often comes up in meetings like this. And that question is, is, Brad, how is it that those who engage in this type of harm and hurt people in such a way, how is it that they are able to re-enter communities after this has gone on? And part of that answer lies here in determinate sentencing. So with determinate sentencing, what we do is we break that time, that duration into thirds. Two thirds by law, if they go to prison, if it is not stayed and they're placed on probation, will be served in the prison and one third will be served in the community on supervised release. And no doubt this triggers the question of why is it this way, because what we may be more familiar with is that older model of parole, where an individual who engages in any kind of uh, felonious criminal conduct or harm goes to prison and in order to be released before their expiration must go before a, a board or a panel. And this is a much more familiar process, although most states have gone away with it. And what we would find with that older model was that most boards or panels would be very hesitant or resistant to allow somebody with a person crime of any level to re-enter the community early and would end up sitting the duration of their sentence in prison all the way through till expiration. Now, no doubt upon hearing that, you're nodding, thinking, Brad, we'd be okay with that. They, they've earned their, their uh, time to sit that entirety. But what we found, again, back to that data and research, particularly with those that in, involve themselves in sexual crimes and harm, is that having them sit that full duration only to expire in the prison system and be walked to the gate at that date where it ends and more than 90%, 90% or better, will expire from Minnesota prisons right now as we look at our total population. So keep that in mind. And at that expiration date, they're walked to the gate and they're told, don't come back. And when we looked at recidivism, re-offense in the same or similar fashion, what we found was that model was ineffective. It did not work to reduce that risk of recidivism in a significant enough way that we thought we were really achieving something. However, with determinate sentencing, we found that we very much do impact that recidivism risk to the point now where when that final third is initiated, because that two thirds in, they were focused on their treatment, their uh, spiritual health, their mental health, and so on, that the handoff then went to their supervision team in the community who helped oversee them and made sure that they were adapting their lives to these new patterns of conduct and behavior. So that when that expiration date came, they had internalized those skills 
and could manage themselves effectively going forward. And our recidivism rates fell. And so this is why we have that de determinant sentencing model. So for Mr. Pipe Boyd, he went to prison, did his two thirds in, and then went to his one third out on uh, supervision. One additional component uh, that I wanna share with you about his criminal history, again, not an exhaustive criminal history, but because registration is very much a component of that sexual harm uh, umbrella, and it's a requirement that he has because of the harm he's engaged in, um, it's important to talk about. So in 2017, Mr. Pipe Boyd fell out of compliance with the registry. Now, as far as risk to reoffend goes, know this, that failure to register is not predictive of future sex risk. It is predictive of future failure to registers. So just keep that in mind. So with this 2017 failure to register, uh, law enforcement uh, was able to ascertain where Mr. Pipe Boyd was and brought charges against him. Failing to register is in and of itself its own crime. And for that crime, he received a 43 month commit to prison. Again, two thirds in, one third out on supervised release. So Mr. Pipe Boyd's prison chronology with regard to his registrable offense conduct and patterns is as follows. In October 2013, he entered prison for that assault third degree, remembering that that CSC3 was a charged offense, but not convicted. And on August of 2014, he was released at that two thirds point. And for my number counters, know that they also include credit for time served. Um, but he was released to the intensive supervised release program and designated as a risk level three. So he's been in within Minnesota community since 2014 with that level three designation. And in April of 2015, he reached that expiration date. And with regard to this crime, his rights were restored to him. So as it stands today with this man, he is not under any correctional supervision. He has no supervised release or local probation. He does, however, remain subject to the registry. So although all of his rights are restored to him and he is free to live as you or I, um, he must still maintain his registration with law enforcement and that is required of him for life. And so law enforcement will always know where he lives, where he works, what he drives, et cetera. And for as long as he retains that level three designation, you will be able to see where he is within Minnesota communities. Now I want to shift gears and talk to you about your resources. As you're digesting all of this information, know that your best and most direct resource for any questions you may have about this man or this population or anything as your awareness has been broadened is your local police department. As you can see, this is something that the Champlain Police Department has been dealing with for a very long time and they are very good at what they do. If you see this man or anyone engaging in conduct or behavior that you believe to be risky or potentially harmful, I want you to call 911 and make sure we're getting the support out to where it needs to be as quickly as possible. If you just have more general questions about the PD's efforts in managing this unique uh, population of folks or whatever, uh, certainly contact their non-emergency number and they'll be happy to assist you further. Other information I want to share with you about resources is with our Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. As you're thinking back to my conversation about having those age appropriate talks uh, with your children, sometimes I have people come up to me at meetings and say, well, I have a, a child with, uh, that has um, uh, special needs or whatever the case may be. How do I speak to them? The JWRC can be one of those really great resources available to you. They have uh, other additional information on their website and I just encourage you to make them a part of your resource toolkit as you're seeking more information on this important topic. Other information I wanna share with you today on your local victim services providers is the Mission Incorporated Programs Home Free Community Program. Inevitably, conversations like this, knowing what we know about sexual harm and how it impacts the people that it does is that the odds of somebody viewing this either live right now or in its recorded form has either themselves been involved in this type of harm or has supported somebody who has been involved in this type of harm and conversations like this no matter how hard we try have a way of evoking those 
old emotions, those, those, uh, those feelings of anxiety and fear can bubble back up. And if you find that this has caused you uh, those types of feelings, or you know somebody that is, is struggling, certainly please reach out to these folks. Um, they are there to assist you and can provide a great deal of services even beyond the, the direct uh, support and counseling help. As I put a bow on things today, uh, before we open it up to q and I really just kind of want to uh, emphasize some of the key points um, as, as, as we conclude here. And that is the 390s and the two R's. If you take nothing else away from all that I've shared, please let it be this, that from what we know from our data and, and all the other available data is that 90% of those who have engaged in this type of harm, sexual harm, do not go on to reoffend in the same or similar fashion. 90% of those that engage in this type of harm are using or exploiting a relationship with the person they're hurting. They're known to that victim, which really turns us to then who should we be most aware of? That 90% or better who have not been previously convicted. Year after year, the Sensing Guidelines Commission in the state has compiled the convictions for sex-related crimes. And from the date they be first began way back, when they first began collecting this data in the 80s on up to today, at no point has the rate of reconviction of known sex offenders been greater than 10%. And far more often, it's lower. 90% of those year after year engaging in this type of harm are not known to the system as sex offenders. So that broad awareness is so very critical. As you digest this information, please remember that it is so much more about that relationship that those who engage in this type of harm build and exploit. Their social proximity is so much more telling than their geographical proximity could ever be. Questions will often come up about the distance that some may live with relation to locations that serve children or vulnerable adults or something to that effect. And, and the reality from what we know is that that geographical distance gives no indication of potential risk. What we know is that if there's a risk in a place that serves children, it will likely come from within its own walls. And so education again is just so critical. Where an individual's head hits the pillow at night is where their risk is at its lowest. It's where they spend those waking hours that we need that highest level of awareness and alertness. And we know that th those folks can be anywhere for any number of reasons. And so that broad awareness is just so critical. I'm just gonna put these up on the screen really quickly. As you're thinking about the resources that are out there, know that there is so much good information out there that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Certainly check these folks out and look to see what additional things they may have. And then lastly, I talked about these both, um, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehensions website and then the Department of Corrections website if you're looking to get some additional information on this topic. At this time, I'll hand it back over to you, Chief, uh, to proctor our Q&A. All right, great, thanks, Brad. Uh, we did have one question come in. You've spoken to this already, but I think you might like to re-emphasize the point. Um, the question is, how is it possible, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, how is it possible that he can move so close to an elementary school and parks? Yes. Uh, considering the number of kids in the area. Right, yep. Uh, a very common question. And it's because we, we look at those areas as being particularly uh, uh, prone to those who mean to, to perhaps uh, engage in harmful conduct or behavior, because this is where that potential victim pool can be found. Um, and what we know is that, that there is no uh, distance that is a quote unquote safe distance, because even if, for example, he or anyone lived outside of, let's just pick a range just for the sake of argument, yeah, 2,000 feet. Um, and they live beyond that, I wouldn't want that school or those people at that park to be any less aware of the situation at hand. I want that broad awareness because he may live outside of that, that comfort zone or that we'll call it that, that safe zone, that safe feeling zone. But we know that even if he lived outside of it, if he meant to do harm within those areas, he could still potentially find himself there. So 
it's a common sentiment. It's a common uh, misunderstanding that by having them live further away from places like that, they're safer. Um, but that is, is genuinely not the case. Ultimately, uh, programs that are in place throughout the nation that do such things actually displace many folks um, to the point where homelessness becomes their only option. And homelessness is a known uh, risk factor. Homelessness increases that instability and that lack of stability can increase those problem behaviors, those underlying issues. And so it's a balance. Um, and so I encourage you uh, talk with those locations. It sounds like there's a school nearby. Speak with the administrators and just find out more about what how they operate and what they do. If somebody from the community this man or anyone were to walk into the building. Um, how do they process visitors? Um, who do they call if they notice something, you know, out, out of the ordinary that, that strikes them? And, and I think that you'll find that that's really truly uh, where you're going to get the best uh, um, efforts towards mitigating any potential risk of harm. Um, and communicate with law enforcement, neighborhood watch groups. If you're thinking about kids as they transit to and from school, some kids walk. Um, having uh, community groups or parents that maybe stand along those routes. Um, you know, there's so many great things that neighborhoods and communities can and should and do um, that it's far in a way exceed what any one individual may present as a risk um, that I think are just of great benefit in, in a more broader context. Great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, the only other comment we have so far is, uh, is by the same questioner, um, and, and they just make the comment that, you know, in his case, Mr. Pipe Boyd has already reoffended uh, and so, at yep. least once. And, 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 and I appreciate that too. We actually call that uh, pseudo recidivism. So when you look at recidivism, the way, the way that uh, the assessors use recidivism is reoffending in a same or similar fashion after intervention. And so with him, he did not have that full array of the state's risk management system. He had some portions, no question, as he got into the juvenile system, which does operate differently from the adult system, um, different goals, uh, different metrics, different measures of success. Uh, unfortunately, he went from that juvenile system into the adult system. Um, but we, we would say, as far as recidivism goes, we mark it from when he gets that full array. And so in Minnesota, that's when he gets sent to prison as an adult for a registrable crime. After that time, no reoffense from that point forward. And so at that point, um, we, we are seeing him as a non-recidivistic sex offender. That does not mean that he does not have multiple sex crimes prior to that full risk management system. It may seem like splitting hairs, but when it comes to application of resources, we find that uh, recidivism rates uh, along uh, the whole, we have recidivism down to a, about 5% nationally when it comes to those engaged in sexual harm. Um, at no point do I wanna elude or let on as though uh, everything's fine, uh, that, that we shouldn't have or keep that level of awareness for this man or others along that same line as him. What I am saying though is we, we don't wanna see him as something more threatening than what he's shown to be. Um, he's, he's what we would call high risk, high need. If he's having those needs met, if he's getting the support and service, services and resources uh, that mitigate that risk, he's implementing those mitigating strategies in his own life, then his risk goes down. Um, and so I hope that makes sense. It may feel uh, you know, like I'm kind of splitting words, but when we look at recidivism, while there may be multiple uh, sex crime convictions, we look at where were they in relation to that array of those risk prevention strategies. And for him, the full array was not applied up until that point uh, where he came through the adult system. All right, thanks a lot, Brad. Definitely. Uh, that takes care of all the questions we have so far. Um, please be aware that if you have further questions later on, you can certainly get a hold of us at the email address that's on your screen right now, offender at ci.champlin.mn.us. Um, and again, that, that email address is strictly for questions about this issue. But feel free to call us if you or contact us there if you have any questions. We're more than happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, I think we're going to end this. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for your time and attention today. today. On behalf of both the Champlin Police Department and the Minnesota Department of Corrections, thank you. And again, any questions, reach out to us.